Don't forget the last Sunday of the month offering will go towards the building fund. This is your announcements for this week.
Good job, choir. And folks, let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I'll read that chapter to us. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with, with good will doing service as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, with which you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. The children of God said, Amen. Amen. John Griffith, will you lead us in prayer? Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all who've gathered to worship here with us. We ask for your blessing for each member and visitor we have here with us today. Speak to our hearts through the reading, singing, and preaching of your word, and bless our pastor as he brings the message. We pray today for those on our prayer list in the midst of personal and medical needs. If it be your will, we ask for mercy and healing for them and, and others throughout our community. We pray for our country and its leaders as we try to navigate our way through unsettling times. We pray for wisdom and decision making for our military and joint chiefs as they plan courses of action against potential threats to this nation. And we ask for safety and security for all citizens of this country, Father. We pray today for those over in Texas and Louisiana that are still dealing in the aftermath of devastating floods. And we pray for people down in Florida and up the east coast of Georgia that are picking up the pieces after this last storm that's come through. And we thank you, Father, so much that you slowed that thing down before it made it up this far and spared us from a lot of damage up here. We thank you, Father, that you gave us such an amazing opportunity to serve those evacuees this week, and you provided for every need that we had, and it was it's just so good to hear that when they finally did make it back home, they didn't have a lot of damage. Father, we ask you to continue to bless this church as we enter into a new church year and continue to guide us as we minister to this community and forgive us of our sins and Thank you so much for your saving grace. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. May be seated. <coughs> We're glad that you're here today. We had a little bit different group of folks here last Sunday. We had all of our evacuees with us, and so that made for a little bit different of service. <coughs> but we're glad that you're here. And uh, I know that you'll uh, go away saying it was good to be in the house of God. Uh, 
I do want to thank all of those that worked, volunteered this past week, uh, put a lot of hours in. <clears throat> we were fortunate in this particular incident. Uh, these folks uh, were willing to uh, help themselves. We're in the tornado uh, incident in January. A lot of folks could not help themselves, and the ones that were damaged fell in and helped us help others. Uh, but um, these folks came in. Uh, I met with them on Monday night and told them they were all packing and ready to go home Tuesday morning, and Brunswick wasn't going to let them in. And uh, so I had to get, break the news to them. <clears throat> and so one of the young ladies sitting on the front here raised her hand and said, well, could we please feed ourselves and and uh, do something for our, our own sale. So I said, sure, uh, I'm always glad to, for folks to do that. And so they went and purchased the food necessary for the uh, Tuesday evening meal and prepared it. This was some of our Hispanic folks and did a fantastic meal. I mean, that was a wonderful meal. That those of us got a chance to share it with them. And so we had, a, we had a good week. We had a lot of folks volunteer. We had other churches come along beside us. A Unity Church came along beside us and helped. Um, Salem Church came alongside and helped and gave a donation. And other churches did. Well, there's several. I wouldn't want to leave anybody out. And then there were other churches out in the community working. I know Isabella was out uh, cutting trees and cleaning yards up. I know that because they came to my yard and cut three trees up and uh, stacked them in the ditch for me. So uh, I was uh, grateful for do that. So a lot of folks were out working, and uh, when these things happen, it brings out the, the very best in some of our folks, and so we're glad of that. I just want to say thank you uh, for that. Uh, Bailey has already made most of the announcements for us, and so uh, that's good. Uh, uh, she t came home after doing that and said, Daddy, can I preach now? And so... Um, <clears throat> So she's trying to take over. And, uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, we appreciate that. Th this is Dale's idea. I appreciate that good idea to involve these uh, youngsters uh, in, in, in our church and, and those things. Uh, next Sunday night, we will not be having church here. We will be having church at Isabella. They're having revival services, and Jason's asked me to speak uh, next Sunday night, and I'm going to be doing that, so we'll just transfer our services down there. I know the puppets are going to have a puppet presentation somewhere. I don't know. Uh, Tim didn't tell me where, but I know they're going to be doing puppet presentations. So our, we'll be divided. Uh, some of us will be at Isabella, and some of us will be on the puppet uh, program doing that. So uh, we're, we're glad that our church will be involved in those. And now, Mandy, my, one of my other daughters, wants to take over and make announcements. So, Mandy? too much that we won't be able to use it, so we don't want it to go to waste, so um, there's a bunch of loaves of bread back in the kitchen, so anybody who needs to make sandwiches or anything, please go after church and go to the back kitchen and get you some bread. It's laid out on the counter back there. We also had a lot, we had put out the need for hygiene kits and um, hygiene items and everything, and, and so we had a lot of that donated, and so we have some call them blessing bags that are made and they're by the front door when you leave. If you know of people in need, whether they're, they could be homeless people, they could be elderly people, um, or people that are school age, you know, just regular or adults that are in need of some maybe a blessing, most of the bags have a Bible verse in stuck in them. It would be really good for anybody to receive one. Um, I have a couple friends I know who carry them in their cars and they give them out to homeless people when they pass them. But, um, and that's such a blessing to them. So um, just feel free to take um, one or two or several if you go somewhere where you see a lot of people in need of those blessing bags so that we don't use them, we don't have them here and, and are not doing anything with them. We want to use those um, the way they were meant to be used to be a blessing to somebody and um, to, to help others in need. So they're in a, um, just in a Rubbermaid box by the front door. So bread and blessing bags. Everybody grab one of each on your way out this morning. Is that okay? Uh, you can bring okay. And we are... Um, we had taken a lot of our tables down um, in the social hall, um, and so we, we want to get our tables back up so that we're prepared for any event, um, or any social event that we might need. So if, if we can get some of the men to help us move tables and chairs this morning right after, after church, um, it won't take us nearly as long as the three or four of us that were here the other night. We were like, we can go ahead and do it. I'm like, no, let's, let's do it after church Sunday morning. <laughs> so, um, so we'll just go back to the social hall and get out. Uh, have probably put out, I think we have eight tables out right now. I think we wanted 16 tables out or as many as we can get in there. So we'll um, go ahead and put those out. Okay. Yes, thank you. Can I talk about me? Okay. You can. Okay. Um, as of right now, as long as nothing changes, we, we, we live day by day, so <laughs> minute by minute sometimes. Um, we are having family night supper. We're planning to do hot dogs and hamburgers and um, all of that, the pro anything you can give. 
we'll be going towards moon. If you can't give, please still come eat. It, you know, we're not having it. You can only pay. You can only eat if you pay. You know, but if you can give a little bit, that will be going towards our trip that we're going to be taking in uh, the end of December up to Macon to the Moose Conference. Um, because we had to move things, I am kind of out of pocket that day, and I'm the one that's supposed to be taking care of this. Um, so if there's some ladies of the church that can maybe come about 4.30 or 5 o'clock, um, we'll need the church unlocked if somebody can take care of that for us to go ahead and start putting some things together. I've talked to Miss Donna. Um, Debbie's going to try to get some things together and be coming to help. So if there's a few ladies that can come, and of course all the youth, as soon as you can come, I need the youth to be here about you know 5.30 or 6 at the latest to help set everything up and make sure we've got everything taken care of. Um, but I hate to put that off on people. I have parents that I'm helping take care of, and we have a doctor's appointment that, <laughs> that day. So, um, but that's what's going on, and we I just hope all of you will come eat with us and at least pray for us that we're going to have a good time when we go to move this year. Yeah. Very good. So if you can uh, help there. Uh, Debbie is sick right now. Hopefully she'll be well by then, but uh, she's got something. Uh, uh, got her very sick today, so y'all be praying for her. All right. Uh, I have a baptismal certificate for Mr. Glenn, a.k.a. Somebody to be at the back door, you want me to? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just go back there. Just okay. come to me. I'll go to the back door. Okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. So I've uh, got a lot going on. Find your place. Let's spend just a few moments as you uh, welcome one another and visit with each other as we stand and greet one another this morning.
children, y'all come down for the children's corner this morning. And while they're coming down, I, we're going to start our Christmas cantata tonight practice. So, if you'd like to join the choir just for Christmas, that's fine. It is going to be a fun cantata. It is not the square old little town of Bethlehem. There's some shucking and jiving and, and jazz in this thing. And we're going to have fun. So, look, you say you can't sing? You can, anybody can sing. You can stand up. L Melissa needs some help on that second row. I mean, look at Doesn't she look lonely? You need a lonely look. Okay, the lonely look. Y'all please come tonight if, if you got any inkling of doing it. A couple years ago, we had a large group come up here, and it really pre pepped this choir up. So y'all just come on down tonight after church and help us sing. Hey, Ryan's lonely, too. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Lonely Ryan. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. Good. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather myself. Just kind of had some sinus stuff going on over the last week. Any of you guys have some stuff like that going on? Me too. Yeah, I think it's kind of going around. I think everybody's kind of having allergies and sinuses. But, well, let's go ahead and read. Uh-oh. Hmm. I think I marked the wrong spot in my Bible. Good thing I used a pencil. Hold on. Let me retry that. All right. Here we go. This is Jesus talking. He says, well, wait a minute, let me back up. Peter is asking Jesus, how many times should I forgive somebody? And Jesus says unto him, I say unto you, don't just forgive them seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. I read a little too far, but I think what Jesus is saying is this verse isn't just, what is seventy times seven? Anybody know? I don't. I can't do math like that. 700 sounds good to me. 700 it is. I don't think Jesus is really saying 70 times 7 or whatever number that is. I think what Jesus is saying is keep on forgiving. Keep on forgiving. I make a lot of mistakes like I did this morning marking my Bible. I marked the wrong verse. You guys ever make mistakes like that? I really do it when I'm writing because I'm a, I have terrible penmanship. You know what penmanship is? It's how, it's how nice you write and how legible, how easily people can read your writing. People can't read my writing. I make a lot of mistakes when I am writing. So I use a pencil. You know why? So I can go back and erase it. That's right. If you use a pen, I can't always erase it, although some pens do. I use a pencil so I can go back and erase it. And these pencils remind me of us guys and girls. We all make mistakes, don't we? Not just in our penmanship, but in life. Don't we make mistakes? We all make mistakes. And how, how many times does Jesus forgive us? How many times does Jesus go back and erase our mistakes? A lot. A lot. <laughs> you think it's 70 times 7? No. How many? A thousand? Maybe a million? A million thousand trillion. I don't think there's a number on it. I think it's so big we can never count that high. He forgives us over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps on forgiving. And Jesus asked that we do the same thing. Because we all make mistakes, he asked that we forgive each other over and over again. Just like you erase your mistake when you make a bad pencil mark like I do. Just keep on forgiving people, okay? Or Just keep if, on forgiving. Or if I draw a guy's pants. Yeah, if you draw my pants, I'd forgive you for it. I'd probably still be a little upset. <laughs> You'll get a belt for that. <laughs> I'll spank you if you do it. All right, let's say a prayer. I'll spank you if you do it. All right, let's say a prayer and thank Jesus for forgiveness, okay? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And God, we thank you that in the Bible you tell us, Lord, that you came to die on the cross for us to forgive us of our sins, Lord, and that your forgiveness knows no boundaries. It goes on forever. And God, you command us to forgive those around us, our friends, God, because we all make mistakes, that we forgive our friends and our enemies, Lord, that we keep on forgiving. And just when we think that, we've, that somebody's made too many mistakes or that we've made too many mistakes and that we don't have any more forgiveness left in us, Lord, we get a new pencil with a new eraser and we forgive them again. And God, we thank you that, you, that you're teaching us how to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, off to hymn number 774. When the roll's called up, y'all, let's all stand.
you need some prayer. activities to glorify God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. The purpose of the Antioch Baptist Church is in all activities to by God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew. We're in the 17th chapter. Pick up reading in verse 14 and read through verse 21. 23. Okay, I'm sorry. Through 23. Matthew chapter 17. Start reading verse 14 through 23. You found that in your copy of Scripture. Would you please stand and honor the Word of God as I read for us? And when they had come, when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic. And suffer severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. 
And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed unto the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. Amen. Amen. All right. I'll be seated. We began on this sermon uh, last uh, Sunday, and because we were doing it uh, with an interpreter, we were certainly weren't able to get all the way through. And so uh, I want to finish it this morning. Uh, realize I read out of Mark chapter 9 last week. It gives this account, and it adds some detail. And so when I'm talking this morning, I'll add some of that detail also to it. And also, uh, it is in, found in Luke chapter 9. And Luke also adds some detail. Uh, so it, you have to put all three of these comparable uh, passages together so that you can get the whole idea of what was going on here. Uh, we uh, see that the main idea, and if you don't get anything else, before we get started this morning, the main idea of this message is there's coming a time for these disciples, and we live in that time, where we live by faith. As a matter of fact, this became uh, one of the uh, uh, cries of the Reformation. Martin Luther, who is the father of our Reformation, the day and age we live in, was reading over in the Old Testament, and he found a passage of Scripture which said, the just shall live by faith. We are faith people. We are to exercise and live in a manner of faith. And we'll see in this message this morning, there's danger when you start trying to live in such a way uh, that you are living by sight, because your sight will deceive you. So let's pick this up and see if we can uh, uh, go through it and give you the general ideas that we need to see out of it this morning. Uh, the context here is we're in the last months of the uh, life of Jesus. Uh, he is in his ministry. Uh, he, is pre he is presenting to the world uh, who he is. Uh, they are making decisions. Uh, do they believe him or do they not believe him? Uh, mighty signs, miracles are being done uh, by him. Uh, they are witnessing it. Some are uh, believing that he might be the, the Messiah. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the disciples are asked, uh, they are, are told that he is. He asked them, as a matter of fact, who do you, who men say that I am? And they said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so uh, he said, upon that uh, type of faith, I'll build my church. And he's in the process of building his church. His church is a faith church. And so uh, now Jesus has taken three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, going up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, there uh, he is fulfilling a prophecy that he had given uh, to his disciples just a few days earlier, and that is some of them would see the, man, the Son of Man in, the, in his glory, and that which he would come back in. And they saw Jesus as he was transfigured uh, there, and something of that glory that will be seen when he comes back on the clouds of glory at the end of the tribulation period. They got a glimpse of that. They needed that. Uh, they needed to understand uh, that what we see and what we live in is not the finality of things. Uh, this world is running its course, and its course will one day be consummated by the God of heaven himself. It appears when we look around us uh, that our world is in absolute chaos, and to some degree it is. Uh, th I mean, just look around you at all the things that are going on uh, that bring uncertainty into the world. But I want to assure you, the world is running on the course uh, that God has planned and predicted and prepared for, and nothing can ultimately happen outside the provisional will of God. I don't have time to deal with all that past, what that statement means, uh, but I want to tell you briefly, that does not mean that God does evil. That's what some folks have concluded is because we live in an evil world, God does evil. No, God has a provision for the world. The world has made its choice, and so it's running on its evil course. God allows for that to take place, uh, but God is bringing it to a conclusion. Now that, the Bible says, is the hope of mankind. And that's what he's trying to show to these disciples here, uh, that no matter what they see, they were going to see in their 
opinion uh, the most horrible thing they could possibly see within nine months, and that is the man that they thought was to be the Messiah, that they thought was going to rule and reign, that they thought had all power, uh, that all of these things were going to be challenged because they were going to see him taken by the Roman government, nailed to an old rugged cross, crucified there, and put in a tomb. And to the natural eye, that seems final. I mean, today, one of the challenges we have is when our loved ones pass. If you simply look at a loved one uh, that has lived uh, according to the Lord, has lived uh, in the Lord, and they pass it, and we take them and we, we uh, have a service for them, we take them to a cemetery and we put them in the ground and they throw the dirt over them and, and we put a tombstone on top of them. If you're not careful, you will believe that's the final event. But I want to tell you, folks, that's not the final event. Uh, that, that is a temporary measure. Because for every child of God, there's coming a day when Jesus, the Bible says, is going to come back from the heavens. He's going to call uh, from the grave every believer that has ever died, rapture them up out of the grave, uh, present them with a new glorified body, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up with them, and there we'll live with the Lord forever, not in a tomb, but in glory. That's the hope. That's what we live by. And that's the hope that they needed. And so he transfigured himself uh, before them. They heard a conversation going on uh, there between uh, Moses and Elijah and our Lord. And uh, there was a specific message going on there. If you miss that message, you miss the hope because they were talking about, the, our Bible says, his demise or his uh, de de deceasing. The literal word behind that is the word exodus. And used by a Jewish rabbi, uh, talking with two uh, Jewish uh, uh, saints that had gone on before, that word meant something. It brought them all the way back uh, to the land of Egypt where for 430 years the children of Israel had been under the subjection of the Egyptian government. And now finally a Pharaoh had arisen that was horrible, tyrannical, and he had put them uh, uh, under such a horrible enslavement uh, that they cried out to God, and the Bible says God sent Moses to them, and Moses caused them to have an exodus. They moved out of the land of despair and into the land of hope. They moved out of the land of problems and into the land of promise. And so here when Jesus is talking about his exodus from this world, he's talking about he's going to uh, prepare a, a, a way that those who choose to do so can move out of this world of despair and into the world of glory. We can move out of this world of trouble and go into the world of triumph. You see, he's saying we need to hear and know those things. We need to see it. And I want to tell you today, the church needs to hear these words. We need to hear it as much as the disciples needed to hear it in that day. For I believe we have come to the day of that we have become blasé. We have become almost to the place where you preach about the second coming of God. We preach about His appearing to us, but I'm afraid today the church does not truly believe that Jesus is coming back again. We live in luxury. We live in comfort. We see no need of a heaven to come. We live in heaven on earth, according to many folks. And so we need that glorious uh, 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 promise before us and every child of God needs to live day by day with the expectancy. I want to tell you, the truth of the matter is when you stand on the street of glory, when you stand in the mansion sublime, when you stand in the heaven of heavens, everything in this world will pale in comparison. <clears throat> the finest house will look like a shanty. The, <clears throat> the most magnificent Sunset <clears throat> will pale in comparison. Nothing in this world has any comparison to what glory has to offer. <clears throat> we need to see that. We need to understand that. We need to believe that. And this is what Jesus was telling them. They come back down from the, the mountain, <clears throat> and as soon as they get back down off the mountain, there's a crowd. They've gathered a multitude, the Bible says. And there's an argument going on in the crowd. His disciples have run up against a man that has a young son, that has seizures. Uh, Matthew calls them epileptic. Uh, they were really demon-possessed seizures. A demon had uh, taken charge of this young boy. Now, I hasten to say, and again, for the sake of time, I don't have time to deal with the whole subject. Come on Sunday nights, we're talking about some of this. You can get some more of it. Uh, but not all sickness, most sickness is not demonic. You look at someone and they have a disease, don't look at them and say, well, that person must have a demon. That is not what the Bible is saying. 
It is in this case. And if you'll notice during the time of Jesus, the demonic activity was severe. There's a reason for that. And I believe also, just as a way of uh, of explanation, at the end time in which we live in, I believe we will also see a rise of demonic activity. And we are. And so anyhow... So uh, the disciples had been asked by this man, could you do something for my son? This demon was a violent, abusive, mean demon. I suppose that's uh, almost, you say, well, he's a demon. Yeah, but we're going to learn here in just a minute, there's orders in the demons. And some of them are more wicked than others. And some of them contain more power than others. Is that this one was trying to kill this young man. That is what the Bible says the devil always comes. Did you know that? The Bible says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Never, never be confused. That which is evil, that which is not of God, its ultimate purpose is to steal your joy, to steal your possessions, to steal you if possible, to kill you if possible, and destroy everything around you. Don't be confused. I mean, today people uh, seem to have come to the conclusion that it's all right to sin, and I'm here to tell you, your Bible does not give you permission to sin. Well, you might say, well, preacher, don't we all sin? Yes, we are sinners, and yes, we do all sin, but a child of God should not be known as a sinner. Sin should certainly cause us great trouble. We should not be able to live comfortably in our sin. We should want to be cleansed from our sins and every day we should want to walk closer to Jesus than I walked yesterday. It should not be my desire to see how much sinning I can do and still get to heaven. And I'm afraid we live in that day. Righteousness, purity, holiness are no longer bywords of the church. No, we, we talk about, are we having the kind of music do we like? We talk about, are the sermons short enough? We, we talk about all kinds of things. We don't talk about righteousness. We don't talk about holiness. We don't talk about purity anymore. As a matter of fact, we're being told that you can't preach on those things anymore. But I want to tell you, if you're not preaching on those things, in my opinion, you're not preaching. <clears throat> You're holding a social service. You're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I want to tell you, it didn't turn out good for the Titanic. And it's not going to turn out good for folks that are playing religion. <clears throat> and so, uh, so here the, uh, they come to, to, to the man. He's not able, uh, his disciples are not able to heal him. And because of that, the naysayers are out there. And they begin to accuse these disciples of being false disciples of a false prophet. By the way, that's what happens when you go out and live like a heathen and claim to be a Christian. The world looks at you and says, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want any of it. When we go out there in public, when we go out in the world and we partake of the things of the world, we we enjoy the things of the world. I'm not saying, listen, listen, I'm not saying you'll never enjoy life. I enjoy life. I'm not saying you ought to never go out and eat somewhere. I'm saying when you go, it ought not to be. Some of the young folks won't understand this. I'm sorry, okay? But some of the old folks will. It ought not to be a honky-tonk. You ought not to go out to the saloon. You ought not to be seen in some of those places. We are a different sort. You ought not to use the rough language of this world. I know every now and then... Folks slip up and say words they ought not to say. That's that's part of being a human. I mean, very few of us can be driving the nail with a hammer and hit the wrong nail with the hammer and not at least grunt pretty loudly. And though you may not say it, God reads your heart. I'm not saying here perfection. I'm saying our goal is perfection. Our goal is not weakness. Our goal is strength. And so here they are, and they can't do anything. And here the naysayers are saying, <laughs> and Jesus walks up. They've been on the Mount of Transfer. It takes them about a day, according to Luke, to get back. They were up high on the mountain. 
See, we forget the reality of what the Bible says and what I'm preaching. We put it in our world. But they were on a mountain. They were on the top of a mountain. You don't just run back down a mountain. If you do, you'll be rolling down the mountain. And so, uh, uh, so uh, it took them about a day to get back. And when they get back, I mean, I, I no doubt Peter, James, and John is about to burst. And they've been told by Jesus, don't say a word. Keep it to yourself. And so here they are. They fill with the glory of God. I mean, they've had a mountaintop. They've been to church and they've had revival. They're ready to go. And they are immediately met by this mob in front of them. And out of the crowd, uh, we find that the father finally cries out, My son is sick. He has an evil spirit. I brought him to your disciples and they could not help him. Now listen, folks. Listen to me carefully. Nobody ought to ever come to the house of God and find out they can't get help here. I'm not talking about physical help. I'm talking about spiritual help. This ought to be the place that a person that's been battered and bruised and beat up can come and get healed and ready to go again. This is a place that's searching for God. They ought to be able to come here and see godliness in this place. I believe that if we live like we ought to live, when a person walks inside that front door, they will be immediately captivated by the power of God if God's people are in this place. If we believe God is who He is, if we believe we've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, I want to tell you, we ought to make an impact on folks. A sinner, when he walks in this church, ought to immediately know that something is wrong with him and he ought not to be comfortable in his sin. You say, well, you're not a seeker-friendly church. I sure ain't. I'm a sinner-friendly church. I believe when a sinner comes, you ought to hear the truth. You ought not to be told, well, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. We're not. If you don't uh, know Jesus, you're not living for it. You're headed for a devil's hell, and we need to be certain that we lovingly, carefully tell him how he can go to heaven. He knows he can go to hell, by the way. He, I don't have to tell him that. He's quite aware of that. What we need to tell him is that we love you. You can go to heaven. So uh, this man comes running, falls down uh, on his knees, and cries out, Lord. Now I want to tell you, if you want to mean business with Jesus, you make him Lord. See, that fellow understood what it was for somebody to be Lord. That meant that you had all the answers, and I don't have any of the answers. Lord meant that he was in charge, and the, the man on his knees wasn't in charge. Lord meant that whatever this man said do, I'll do, because the need is great. As a matter of fact, he found out the need was past anybody that he knew of's understanding. And at this point, he wasn't even sure that Jesus could meet the need. Because he says, Lord, if you can heal my son. If you can, Jesus doesn't say, but if you can believe. The, the, the problem was not in Jesus, and the problem is not in Jesus. Guess where the problem lies today? Turn to your spouse and point to her or him. No, no. Where does the problem lie, folks? It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Here's the problem. The sooner I come to that place and fall on my knees and look up and say, Lord, I believe. And I love this man. I am this man. Because the next statement out of his mouth was, but Lord, help my unbelief. I want to believe. I want to know it's true. But I'm a weak human being. I, I deal with all the fears and all the shortcomings and all the problems that happen in my life. And Lord, as much as I see and know and want to believe, and I do believe, but I need a greater belief. And Jesus just looked at him. Jesus didn't say this, but I have no doubt that he thought this as a, Sir, let me give you something to believe. Let me give you something to believe. His boy, at that moment, has a convulsion. He falls on the ground and wallows on the ground. Foams at the mouth. Can you imagine what, what, what would your heart be for your child? They have that poor child. He has done nothing wrong of himself. And here he is being beaten up, scarred, bruised, probably uh, disfigured. If they throw you in the water and throw you in the fire, 
I have a feeling you're somewhat disfigured by now. He's been trying to kill him. Jesus looks at the man, has compassion on him, says, how long has your son been like that? And he says, all his life. Jesus, the Bible says, looked at the spirit. He said, get out of him. And we find something else about him. This is in the Luke account. We find that this spirit had caused a young man to be deaf and dumb. He could not hear or speak. Can you imagine? Here's the man. His, he couldn't even tell his daddy what was going on inside of him. Here he was, deaf and dumb, unable to speak or hear, and this spirit was beating him up, trying to kill him, throwing him in the water, throwing him in the fire. Here he is at the feet of Jesus, his daddy begging you know, that something might be done for him, wallowing on the ground, and Jesus says, enough. Leave. Now, don't you know something here? He didn't send a letter to a thousand folks saying, if you'll send me $100 each, I can throw the demon out. He didn't say, say I'm going to send you a faith handkerchief. And if you'll just claim your faith and send me some money, your child's going to be all right. Tell you what, are you against these faith preachers on TV? Yes, sir. I sure am. They're charlatans. They're trying to mislead you. They're lining their pockets. So, uh, so he says, Get out of the boy. And then he said something that I think was amazing. He said, and don't come back. He gave him the beat. Kapow! He said, leave and don't you come back. That's what Jesus does, folks. When he walks into your life and takes over your life and he becomes Lord, you know what he does? He gives the devil the boot. Doesn't mean he won't harass you. But he's not going to get you anymore if you're a child of God. After it's over with, the disciples come to him and say, what was wrong with us? Why couldn't we do it? Jesus looked at him and said, remember I told you you were faithless? Your problem was your faith. You were trying to live by sight. And you've got to live by faith. And so you tried to do something. And I want to tell you, you can't do anything. I work through you. When it's you, it's nothing. When it's me, it's something. That's the same today, folks. It's not what we have the ability to do. It's what can we allow God to do through us. Are we willing to say, Lord, Him, I, send me, whatever, you do it. If it's in your will, if it's in your provision, if you say do it, I may not understand how it can be done. I may not have the money to have it done. I may not uh, understand all the things about it. I may not even feel able to do it. But Lord, if you say do it, you can do everything. I can't do anything. And when you begin to work in the power of God, that which would seem uh, impossible suddenly becomes possible. He said, he made, uh, like Josh I told the children this morning, I don't think he was quite as concerned about the number, and I don't think he was concerned about the size here. He said, if you just had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could tell a mountain, it'd be moved and thrown to water. I think he's using hyperbole there. He's making a point. He says, what you need is just some faith, just some belief in me. Just so to know that whatever is in my will can be done. Exercise a little faith. And that's what God's calling on us to do today. Just exercise a little faith. Just trust Him. Just allow Him to use us. I believe, I, honestly, I believe there's an unimaginable amount of ability in this room. Beyond your belief. I believe there's folks sitting here in this room that God wants to use in a way that they have no clue that they're able to be used and the only thing that is holding us back is we need to exercise just a little faith. Is God great? That's yes, this is no. Yes, He is. Can God do everything? Is He working through us? Then what we have to do is to give up on us and give Jesus all there is. He just needs a few more people on their knees that look up and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He says, the reason you couldn't do it, because this one's a little tougher than the other ones. 
He says there's an order here. That, the word there behind that word is the word genus. That is the Greek word uh, behind kind. And it means species or types. And so he says there's types of demons. And you guys run up against a hard one. And there's hard things out here, folks. Everything is not easy. We're not preaching a health and wealth and prosperity gospel. Life is tough. You run up against some things sometimes that are very difficult. And he says, how do you deal with it? He says, spend some time in prayer. In, in uh, Mark, he says, prayer and fasting. Luke, he says, prayer and fasting. He says, you, you know what? The idea here, see, we, 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 we want a plan. We want, well, okay, preacher. One, two, three, tell me how to do it. So go spend 15 minutes in praying, five hours in fasting, 15 more minutes in praying, and another five hours in fasting, you'll get what you want. Well, that's not what the Bible's talking about. You know what the Bible says here? Come find out. That's what prayer and fasting is. Find out what is on my heart. What, what's what we need to do. It's not what's on my heart, it's what's on God's heart. He says, spend some time praying. I want to tell you, the power of any individual and the power of any church is directly related to how much that church or that person prays. It's not what we do. It's how we pray. Nobody, this is not an open answer. This is not a shake your head one, okay? This is just for you personally and me personally. This past week, how much time did you devote in sincere, dedicated prayer asking God what you should be doing in your life? How much time did you spend, did I spend? I, I'm not pointing the fingers, I'm saying me too. How much time did we spend? I, I'm not saying, Lord, thank you for my lunch. That's good, I, I encourage that. I'm not saying, now I lay me down to sleep. Because most folks are going to sleep before now, now I lay me down. I'm talking about time that you set aside and say, this is me and God's time. We live in a world, and I'm, again, not against this, we say, uh, for us married folks, we ought to, if we want to keep a good, strong marriage, we ought to set aside some time, a date night or some specific time that we spend just with our spouse so that we don't lose touch with them. We spend so much time trying to raise kids, do homework, uh, uh, provide a, a living, earn, that sometimes couples get pulled apart in trying to do good things. And so they're told, that they, we're told, that we need to spend some time. But you know what? If that's true here, how much more is it true with our Heavenly Father? Do you really believe that we can have a strong relationship with God without ever spending dedicated time in prayer to Him? If that's the case, how much are we spending? You reckon that might be part of the problem today? Might, might that be a little bit? He says, this kind does not come out but except prayer. Prayer being the emphasis, by the way, in this passage and fasting. And then we find out in the very last verse, he tells them one more time. I'm going to leave you. I'm not going to be here. You're going to have to live by faith. I'm going back to the Father. See, the problem is, I'm going to close with this, trust me. If you try to live by sight, somebody is going to deceive you. If you put your confidence in somebody, and just, that's the person I'm watching. Now, Paul told some folks, follow me as I follow Christ, but he said, be following Christ. If you put your confidence in somebody and that person fails, guess what happens to you? You get destroyed. You have to have your confidence in Him. If you're looking for signs and miracles, you know what the Bible says in the last days is going to happen? Satan is going to come along and he's going to start deceiving folks with wondrous lies, signs, and miracles. Now, I know most of that will take place in the tribulation period, but I believe some of it is taking place now. And if you're not careful, the devil will lead you astray thinking that some wonderful thing, how could it be anything else but God? But I want to tell you, if it's not, you're not spending time in praying, if you're not reading your Bible, you do not follow signs and wonders. Follow Jesus. And it ends, it says, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. 
That's what doing it the wrong way causes. It will cause sorrow, not joy. One today. If we were to build our church on your prayer life, what kind of church would we have? God just come down this morning and said, I'm going to pick one person out. And we're going to run this church on that person's prayer life. Do you stand up and say, Lord, I'm not the best in the world, but I'd love to pray to you. Or would you say, Lord, don't use me. I'm a poor clay. I, don't, I can't find time. You know what I found out in my life? I find time to do that which is important to me. I make time three times a day to eat. I, re I have a busy schedule, but somehow I always work eating in there. Isn't that amazing? You know why? It's important to me. I found time last night to sit down for almost three hours and watch Georgia beat up on some poor little team out of Alabama. Nothing wrong with that unless I'm not making time for Jesus. And then that's real wrong. Every one of us have enough time to do what we need to do. The question is, is it important to us? Father, as glorious and wonderful as it is to look forward to your coming and to see you in all your marvelous glory, for this day in which we live, Father, we need to be reminded that we live in a world that is difficult. Sin abounds. And we need strength to live in this day. And you plainly told us that strength comes by spending time with you and your word and praying. And yet, Father, most of us spend far too little time searching the heart and mind that you have. Rather, we spend way too much time doing what we want to do. Convict our hearts, Father, this morning. Draw conviction in this room.